Hello, and thank you for joining today's webcast, COVID-19 Observations in Germany and ECMO Considerations, which will be delivered in just a moment by Dr. Armin Kalenka and Dr. Philip Lepper. My name is Lisa Nolan, and I am the Global Clinical Insights and Education Leader for the Anesthesia and Respiratory Care segment at GE Healthcare. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. First and foremost, we send our sincere gratitude to all the clinicians and healthcare industry workers who are on the front lines fighting this pandemic. Our goal is to support educational events like this that may help you as you care for COVID-19 patients so you may have the best chance of sending them home safe healthy. Thank you for your tireless efforts and personal sacrifices. Before we begin, we want to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application widgets which you can use. I'll briefly cover the most important one. For those who may benefit from closed captioning in English, you can access subtitles by clicking the square CC widget icon at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget. We will try to answer as many as possible at the end of today's presentation. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the health widget at the bottom of your screen. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs running in the background. Lastly, this webinar recording is the exclusive property of GE Healthcare. No part of the following content may be copied or reproduced without prior written permission of GE Healthcare. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our webcast presentation, COVID-19 Observations in Germany and ECMO Considerations, given by Dr. Armin Kalenka and Dr. Philip Lepper. Dr. Kalenka is the Senior Medical Director of the, for the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care Medicine, KKH, Bergestrasse, Heidelberg University Hospital in Heppenheim, Germany, and is an Associate Professor at the Heidelberg University Clinic. He has authored 60 scientific publications on respiratory disease, perioperative management, and anesthesia care, and holds annual workshops on mechanical ventilation. Dr. Lepper is a pneumonologist, intensivist, and an associate professor at the Clinic for Pneumonology, Allergology, and Intensive Care Medicine at the Saarland University Hospital in Hamburg, Saar, Germany, where he oversees the ARDS and ECMO program. He has authored numerous scientific publications on mechanical ventilation and the use of ECMO treatment as a bridge to recovery for transplantation and patients with acute respiratory failure and interstitial lung disease. Now I'll pass it over to Dr. Armin Kalenka. Thank you, Lisa, for introduction. And hello, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar from Germany. It's a great pleasure for us to have you with us. And just jump into the first slide directly. Some of you may already know this. There is something special in Germany. And as you can see here on that couple of weeks ago in the middle of our capital, just one people is around there. And the question of New York Times was, if we do something different because our death rate in coronavirus are so low. What you can see is that we were expected about Easter to have the wave hitting us. It was the 10th of April, East Friday, 1,600 million people are infected. And nearly three weeks later, the total amount in the world nearly doubled. In Germany, there was only 50,000 more cases. And what you can see here is on the left side, in the upper uh, slide, it's the cases per day. And on the left side, on the down, you can see the deaths per day. And in both graphs, you see clearly that we were able in Germany to decrease and flatten the curve. That was that what our counselor 
Angela Merkel told us that we do everything to flatten the curve. One idea why we have the situation is that we might test more than other countries. But as you can see in this slide, there is Germany more or less in the middle of testes per 1,000 uh, residents. So we do it more or less very similar to Italy and Spain. We are not so good like Iceland. We are not so good like Luxembourg. And in a couple of uh, weeks, we will even be higher testing people, even if they are asymptomatic. What you can see this in this slide is that we are very, very good in the ICU beds per 1,000 residents. So we nearly the top leading nation, at least in Europe, we have around 34 beds per 1,000 people. And we were asked the starting of March to double these ICU beds. So we actually have much more ICU beds available in preparation for the coronavirus pandemic. You see data from the so-called German intensive care register. The ground, the gray, sorry, the gray map show you in the south part, there is a capacity of beds around 10%. And on the right side, you can see down to the district level that we clearly have some hotspots where around 50%, around half of the ICU beds are occupied by ventilated COVID-19 patients. But as you can see, especially in the middle of Germany and the northern part, we have beds occupied by COVID-19 patients down to five, even sometimes down to zero percent. So no single COVID-19 patient is there. This is the same register. It's uh, the intensive register from Germany. So we had uh, last week around 2,200 COVID-19 patients on ICU. 27% around them were ventilated. But we had around 13,000 free ICU beds. So only 20,000 were occupied. So we had a lot of free ICU beds in Germany. Here you can see the map of whole Germany. And in the middle of Germany, there is the so-called federal state, Hessen. This federal state is the federal state where my hospital is. And you can see down there on the left, Philip's uh, federal state is called the Saarland. He will speak after me. And uh, we have a kind of register in Hessen as well. And this register clearly show us how many normal ICU beds we have. So we have in my federal state around 1,500 ICU beds, and we were able to a maximum ICU beds of around 2,200. Some of these beds will be then in the worst case scenario equipped with anesthesia machines for ventilated patients. 1,000 occupied ICU beds on Easter, that means around 500 free beds, and we have only in the federal state of Hessen around 43 ECMO beds. We were discussing that already. We were expected to hit them by the wave around Easter. And again, three weeks later, the same amount, 1,500 normal ICU beds, maximum 2,200, many of them occupied around 1,000, but in other words, around 500 free fully equipped ICU beds, and again, 40 ECMO beds were available in the last week. So what we did in Germany basically is we were hoping for the best. And of course, we were prepared for the worst and unsurprised by anything in between. So that allowed us in Germany, even more than everywhere else, to an individual approach of the COVID-19 pneumonia. And the question is, what is probably the best approach for these patients in the purpose of ventilatory support? What is the best practice in mechanical ventilation? 
And as you know, even better than me is more or less from the literature is coming from acute respiratory distress syndrome. We should go for 6 ml per predicted body weight. We should use the RDAs network table, which is more or less based on oxygenation. We should use high PEEP, especially for severe RDS. We should use the prone position, especially for severe RDS. And you know the story, we might use neuromuscular blockers for severe RDS. The Rose trial tell us, no, maybe not. And maybe it's a good idea to know what not to do, and maybe it's not a good idea to put a severe RDS patient on non-invasive ventilation. Just recently, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign published uh, guidelines for the management of the critical ill coronavirus disease patient. I just take part of these guidelines, the part for the mechanical ventilation, and what you can see here is they have uh, literature research, uh, systemic reviews on acute respiratory distress, on SARS, on MERS, and on COVID-19. And then they did an ev evidence profile and had a panel discussion. And out of this is coming the recommendation. That is a normal way how, I would say, guidelines should be implemented. But if you go to the PubMed literature, and as you can see, what's happened here is actually that is the uh, recommendation. And the only recommendation from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, which are strong recommendations, are the recommendation of using low tidal volume, using a target uh, plateau pressure lower than 30 for the patient, and suggesting a high PREP strategy again everything in acute respiratory distress syndrome. If you go into the literature and check that, you find more than 8,000 publications about COVID-19. What you want to do is, of course, evidence-based medicines. So our idea, our hope is that we have a lot of randomized controlled trials clearly show us what to do or maybe not to do. And if you click on PubMed, randomized controlled trials, you will only find two publications. At least it's only one because here is a double fold in the PubMed actually. It's the only randomized controlled trial actually published for COVID-19 patients, unfortunately not in the field of mechanical ventilation. And even that, some also say, do we really need acute respiratory distress syndrome definition? Or it is just a description of a couple of symptoms. And if it's probably better not to treat the patient like an RDS patient, maybe it's better to treat the patient like it is, and it's an hypoxic, septic patient. But let's see what the literature independent of randomized controlled tiles in COVID-19 patients bring us. So some of you may saw these letters from uh, Professor Gattinoni, and he stated there that COVID-19 does not lead to a typical acute respiratory distress syndrome. So you might argue that the, all the recommendation I told you before will not be the right idea because it is not an acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you see, on 27th of March, the publication paper was received. Three days later, it was accepted, and on the same day, it was published in the literature. And he, and he mentioned there, after considering that all we have to ventilate this patient and buying time with minimum additional damage. The background is a patient count of 16. A couple of days later, it was published the 14th April. Interestingly, in another journal, received 24th of March, accepted 31st of March, that more or less the same authors described a different picture of the same COVID-19 pneumonia. 
And what they did, they implemented these two phenotypes. It's called the type L and the type H. And I will come to that further on, which is the difference between that. The type L is that what we already know from the letter before. It's that patient which you can ventilate soft because they have a good compliance. And you may go up with the tile volume up to eight to nine. The type H is that what we clearly know as severe RDS patient. And you might have the patient better on higher PEEP, prone positioning, and maybe on ECMO. So at the end, I was a little bit confused, honestly, because the same authors, very famous authors, have more or less two different pictures published. And honestly, I try to figure out what is the reality. And that is a very complicated slide now, so I will go slowly over that. So the type L is the type of patient with low elastance, a low Q uh, mismatch, a low lung weight, and a low recruitability. So as recruitability is very low, it might be not a good idea to put the patient on prone position and might be not a good idea to put the patient on high PEEP. On the other side, it's a type H. And type H is high elastins, high right to left jump, high lung weight, and a great possibility to recruit the patient. So the question is, is this simplified model from Gattinoni a black and white situation? where you can say, okay, this specific patient is the type L, and the other guy coming yesterday is the type H. And of course, it is not such simple. It's just a model. It's an idea to even simplify things. And in reality, it's more or less a progression. So in reality, it's more or less a possible way which the patient has to go. What is the problem? What is the physiological, the pathophysiological problem of this patient? And the pathophysiological problem of this patient is the so-called patient self-inflicted lung injury. Together with a viral load, you know we don't have a specific medication for this SARS-CoV-2 virus, so the only thing we can do is to reduce the patient's self-inflicted lung injury. And if the patient is coming with low edema, with a little bit of respiratory distress, of course, you will give the patient oxygen. You might go for high-flow nasal cannulars, which we are not very often used in that patient, because, you know, we are a little bit afraid of the virus so maybe the patient is get stay home longer and it's not in a good shape and you have to go for non-invasive ventilation. We in our department never use CPAP alone. We always give a pressure support. So the idea is to stop this patient's self-inflicted lung injury, for example, to give non-invasive ventilation. Or sometimes you have to intubate the patient. Here you can see mentioned the so-called early intubation. Maybe the patient is coming in severe situation, severe hypoxic, because he stayed long at home or he stayed long on the normal ward. And then you will do the late intubation. On the left side, it's the type L. On the right side, is the type H. And obviously, the perspective you have is that, for example, by non-invasive ventilation, you will be able to stop the process. And by stopping the process, the patient will heal and can be discharged home. But of course, because we have no single measurement, no single medication, no single intervention for the SARS-CoV-2 virus, maybe the patient gets worse. And maybe he will suffer from severe RGS like we know before. So my personal perspective is, my individual approach is that we are not treating RGS or the so-called TARDS, the COVID-19 associated acute respiratory distress syndrome. What we are treating is hypoxia and especially the respiratory distress. 
So what you can see here is a family, a mother, a father, and a son. All of them have arterial blood gas analysis. And what you clearly can see here that all three of them, all three, of course, were COVID-19 positive. All three of them have a good saturation. But all three hyperventilate. So they prevent by hyperventilation the hypoxia. All blood gas analyses clearly show a good saturation, but the pH in all three of them is alkalotic. So that is, from my perspective, an even better signal that the patient is in respiratory distress, that he is hyperventilated than the saturation with or without oxygen alone. But of course, you have to have a very simple flowchart, especially during a pandemic situation, that is a flowchart from our hospital. And if the patient is hyperventilating, he has to be admitted to the hospital. Depends on his reaction to oxygen and the saturation. If this is very good with a little bit support of oxygen, he might go for the normal ward. If he need more, oxygen up to five liter, we will submit him to the intensive care unit where we have the intermediate area. And if the patient is really severe, so need more than five to six liters of oxygen to get the saturation higher than 92, he will be admitted to our open intensive care unit two for the COVID-19 patients. Most important in these patients is to reduce the so-called self-inflicted patient lung injury, as I mentioned many times before. And what we are giving is we are giving oxygen. And our aim is to give as much oxygen as the patient is needed to be, have no hyperventilation anymore. And, of course, we are using non-invasive ventilation. And as you can see here, this patient is on an inspiration of oxygen about 80. The PEEP is on 10 and the pressure support is on 15. So he is very, very high supported. Many of my colleagues would directly intubate this patient. In this specific patient, he was quite comfortable with that. He was very, very compliant. So we tried to go further on with that. Interestingly, last week there was an investigative uh, called pseudo publication in the German television. And the question they want to answer is that might be the intubation in COVID-19 harm more than benefit. And the reason for that was two different recommendations. One recommendation coming from a couple of German societies, they supported to be rather restrictive with high flow nasal cannulas and non-invasive ventilation. And they promoted, if the PF ratio is lower than 200, to do an early intubation in these patients. Just to have in mind, personal protection equipment in every case is absolute essential for the care of these patients. Another group, it's uh, the German Respiratory Society, they said, yes, non-invasive ventilation can be administered, administered to these patients as long as the criteria for the endotracheal intubation are not fulfilled. So it's more or less a rest restrictive approach for intubation, it's more or less a kind of promotion of the non-invasive ventilation approach. So one idea might be like this, the patient is uh, bad, is hyperventilating, you give him high flow nasal cannula or a lot of oxygen and you will have to check the response of the patient. If the CO2 is not going down, you might uh, put the patient on non-invasive ventilation. If the patient have a lower CO2, a better saturation, and you check that every two hours, you will stay probably with oxygen therapy alone. In our department, if we go to non-invasive ventilation, we always starting with a PEEP of 10. We give a lot of pressure support early, 
8 to 15 if the patient is tolerate that well we can reduce the pressure support we are not promoting to do a low pressure support approach in these respiratory distress patient you have to check that if the saturation is still bad, the patient is still in a lot of respiratory distress, has a lot of respiratory drive, you might be have the intubation criteria fulfilled. Otherwise, you check that very, very often you will be very, very on the bedside on the patient if they, and check if it's not necessary to intubate him. And then... In our unit, we start always in this flow chart with a start PEEP of 12 to see how the patient is coming out of that. And then, of course, you have these two types, which are a continuum and not an A and B or black and white. So that is the so-called L-type COVID-19 patient. Here is a measure with a specific ventilator, the so-called end exploratory lung volume, which is quite good, which is more or less normal because not a lot of infiltrations, not the classical picture of a patient with an RGS. And as you can see, the compliance in these patients is very, very good. It's more or less 80 milliliter per centimeter of water. So it's more or less the normal compliance in a patient which is on the ventilator. And that might, that might allow you to do a higher tidal volume on this patient, if you think that you have the need to do that. That is the publication recently show that the low tidal volume ventilation strategy is as good as the intermediate tidal volume strategy in patients without acute respiratory distress syndrome, which might be the so-called type L. They checked six versus 10, but they end up with no difference. But you have to have in mind, the tidal volume disease study was in one group six, and in the other group it was nine. They were aiming for 10, but they end up with nine. Have in mind the driving pressure. As long as the driving pressure is low, 10, 12, 14, maybe the tidal volume you will be getting to this driving pressure is not so bad. And if you have a patient which is, for example, in right heart failure, which is very, very responsible to CO2, might be it is a good idea to give him some more tidal volume to get out the CO2. And of course, you will have patients with the classical radiology picture of a severe RS. This is also a COVID-19 patient. As you can see, it's already intubated and the lung is quite bad, bilateral infiltrations, or criteria of acute respiratory distress syndrome are fulfilled. And what already is mentioned, the end exploratory lung volume in these patients is very low. The compliance in these patients is very low. But in these patients, in contrast to the early phase to the type L patient, you can clearly see a recruitment effect. The PEEP of 22 and higher leading to a more or less normalization of the end exploratory lung volume give you a clear signal that a higher PEEP in this specific patient on an individual approach might be of benefit. The problem with mechanical ventilation is always the same. One size does not fit all. So just to have another small picture in this field. This is a story published in German mostly. It's about 50 hospitalized COVID-19 patients with and without acute respiratory distress syndrome. And the interesting thing is the patient, they fulfilled the criteria for acute respiratory distress syndrome. Half of them were uh, in the whole group, mostly around 50% of them were obese. So a classical strategy based, for example, on oxygenation, based on RDS network table, will lead probably to a very low PEEP, but we know, especially in this group of obese patients, that they will profit from a higher PEEP. Higher PEEP in this group, 20, 22, 24. These were patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome and obesitas. The last idea, 
about self-inflicted lung injury. Of course, it is not only a problem of the initial state. It's not an only problem of admission day. We see it also in patients which are on the third, fourth, fifth day. PF ratio is quite good, stabilization of everything, and you're going in the kind of weaning process. And a classical idea would be to reduce the PEEP in these patients and see what's happened on because PF ratio is fine. This is an excellent review about the patient's self-inflicted lung injury and the influence of PEEP in spontaneous breathing. What you can see already in the title, they spoken about safe, spontaneous breathing. So what they did is they did higher PEEP management even in patients with spontaneous breathing. So we will take everything together. The point is to the question, what is the target in the field of lung protection? And as you can see in this very, very uh, nice review, it's obviously not that what we many, many times have in the focus, oxygenation. It's not the PF ratio, it's even neither the CO2 elimination. Especially the first point, the biological predisposition to biophysical lung injury in COVID-19 might be of extraordinary interest in that field. So what we are doing is we see these patients with COVID-19 pneumonia as a heterogeneous group. You don't know what you get out of the pool. It might be a very early phase, it might be a very late phase, it might be in the middle. And obviously, there is no one-size-fits-all approach. Patient self-inflicted lung injury is, from my perspective, the absolute key parameter. The oxygenation, as you probably know, they have excellent oxygenation sometimes, sometimes are really, really deep hypoxic the titration, according to RDS network table, is, from my perspective, useless because you don't know if it's an early phase or a late phase. You should not super-optimize the blood classes. So our pH aim is 7.25, and you might have to individualize your therapy. You should at least measure uh, the driving pressure. If you are able, you have to measure the intra-abdominal pressure. The paragmat meter here is uh, obesitas. If you are able, you have to measure the end exposure lung volume or the esophageal pressure. And of course, you have to see the whole patient. You have to de do normal ICU medicine as you always do, not only mechanical ventilation support. And to be very, very pragmatic in the way of uh, the ventilatory support. If you want to just have one single parameter, go for the delta P for the driving pressure. And that is the classical worst case. That is a red type, a lot of edema, the severe RDS patient. And try to increase the PEEP and see where your delta P, your driving pressure, is lower than 15. And maybe you have the early phase, the so-called type L, the L type. And these patients maybe have an even better compliance and very, very low elastins. So the, their driving pressure, you might titrate even better. You might go for a higher tidal volume. And with my last slide, I want to thank you. And I think I don't have to say a lot about this last slide. I will give you a couple of seconds to read it. That is what we learned in the COVID-19 pandemic. We have to learn, we did that. We are doing our best actually, and we are hoping for the best for tomorrow. And with this last slide, I will directly go give over to Philip Lepper from uh, University Clinic of Saarland. Philip. Well, I mean, thank you for your um, presentation. Somehow my slide does not look, ah, no, it, it's, better. Um, thanks for the, for the presentation. I really enjoyed it because actually this is a lot like we do it. Um, and um, I also want to welcome the, the audience and I want to give a 
brief introduction um, because that's also maybe interesting how we um, we set up our our unit. Um, we have a 24-bed ICU and we we do some um, ECMO service, but currently the ICU is solely for COVID positive uh, patients. So we set up an airlock chamber and uh, we strictly isolate all the um, COVID positive patients. Um, of course, personal protective equipment is very important. Um, so we use overalls, FFP3 masks, which is the equivalent to N95 mask in, in the US. Um, we use safety goggles plus a visor and double gloves, and our first COVID positive patient arrived on March 14th. We still perform all regular ICU procedures, so we do, of course, intubation. We um, performed tracheotomies on basically all um, patients because, as you can see in the further slides, um, I assume that all these intensive care patients with COVID-19 infections um, need quite a lot, um, quite a long time to heal. And up to now, we had no um, COVID-19 infections in our staff. Um, this is uh, how we made up our, our unit. This is the part with uh, 16 beds. There's another floor with uh, eight beds. And uh, we have this airlock chamber um, in front of the unit and then behind all patients are COVID positive and we, we strictly test that um, no negative patients um, come into this area and we have two, um, two rooms where you can additionally, additionally isolate these patients. So we actually um, made sure that uh, we educate and always re-educate the, the personnel on um, personal protective equipment and uh, we put a strong emphasis on basic hygiene measures. Um, we soon did not allow any visitors to um, um, make sure that uh, possible COVID positive persons don't enter the, the ward. We made an exemption for um, relatives of dying patients, um, which was luckily not very frequently uh, needed. And we have an enhanced surveillance for infections in, in healthcare workers um, so that we make sure that possible um, positive uh, personnel is then early identified and uh, put on quarantine. Additionally, we implemented stress and burnout prophylaxis. Um, we reduced the length of the shifts and we also um, made sure that everyone uh, eats and drinks properly and we have a close supervision by a psychotherapist. And um, on top of that, the personnel of our COVID ICU was reinforced by uh, workers from other intensive care units that, that had a reduced service during um, this first phase of infection. Um, additionally, we had, oh sorry, um, we had a transfer of French patients. I show you these slides because that was actually a, a great experience. We flew with uh, two helicopters to a parking lot in France and we took over some uh, COVID-19 positive um, patients uh, from France nearby, um, five of them are still with us. And I want to show you some um, cases of these patients. So we have um, here a 60-year-old otherwise um, healthy person. Um, and uh, this, this person is uh, actually uh, intubated since 26 of of March. He experienced um, frequent phases of prone position um, and we performed a tracheotomy. However, he did not improve and he went on VV ECMO on 3rd of April with an oxygenation index of 76. 
And now since a couple of days, he's on a wake ECMO. But as you can see on these two um, chest X-rays, um, there is still um, some infiltrates on on this um, in this in this patient's patient. And additionally, he experienced pulmonary embolism, something which is uh, frequent. Um, so not only pulmonary embolism, but thrombosis. Um, of all sorts and uh, strokes uh, as well. So there's another gentleman, he's 69. Um, he has basically arterial hypertension, diabetes, and he is a bit overweight. And also here you can see this, this patient was intubated like six weeks ago. He went through prone positioning, um, over more than a week. Um, in between, he was extubated and we put him on non-invasive ventilation also with uh, pressure support, but that lasted only for about a week. And then we had to re-intubate the, the patient and then the next day we performed a tracheotomy and he um, also went on VV ECMO then with an oxygenation index of 50. And as you can see, he is free from, from ECMO um, by May uh, 2nd, but there are still um, tremendous infiltrates um, and it really looks like, still like ARDS. And then another patient, same picture, um, long time intubated, uh, still, still on, on uh, VV ECMO on May 2nd. He went off then, but as you can see, more than a month on uh, VV ECMO. And uh, he was COVID positive 12th of March, and he is still um, he is still positive. So as Armin mentioned, we have no specific treatment, um, so we just can try to make a good intensive care um, medicine and, and keep these patients alive, which is actually um, possible from, from my point of view. This is the patient um, I just showed to you, and here are representative slices uh, through the lung, March 19th and April 24th, uh, along with uh, some lab values. And as you can see, the patient um, had a sharp rise in interleukin-6 up to 12,000 which uh, prompted us to treat him with uh, tocilizumab. And uh, I will show you further on what I think is uh, the, the story behind uh, fibrinogen. But again, as you can see here, this is quite a very long, um, a long way this patient uh, went and he is still not out of all of the problems. Um, I want to show you in this panel down here um, some perfusion data, which was uh, done with a dual energy um, computed tomography, and you see there's all, everything is very well um, perfused, so this points to um, a, a very high uh, right to left shunt because you see there um, a lot of infiltrates, and the patient is at that time uh, still profoundly um, hypoxic. Well, if we come to the question, ECMO and COVID-19, is, is this a bad idea? Because there's uh, um, data provided by uh, Henry and colleagues. They analyzed at least four um, yeah, published papers on the treatment of COVID-19 patients with ECMO. And as you can see, the, the numbers are very low, but the survival rates are low as well and, and actually um, disappointing. So what we know about um, uh, ECMO in general is uh, that it obviously does not do any harm because we have the EOLIA trial and as you know from the safety analysis, there's the, the stopping triangle. Um, the recruitment was stopped because um, after 240 patients, it was very, very unlikely to see a difference between the ECMO group and the conventional um, treated group. 
So um, the recruitment was then stopped, but we know um, that ECMO works very well with regard to certain technical parameters, so we can reduce the tidal volume, we can reduce plateau pressures, um, we can reduce the driving pressure, Armin already mentioned, and we can change, um, for example, pH and uh, CO2 very effectively, and at least it translates um, into some mortality benefit if you uh, look at the absolute reduction in mortality that was uh, 11 Eleven percent, and I think this is not um, this is not too bad. Um, so if you look at uh, if you look at the patients, and I uh, I stole this one from uh, Armin, um, you can see that actually this one lady um, is hyperventilating, and he Armin made a very good point from from my point of view. Um, but you should also consider that um, if, if you look at the alveolar gas equation, um, the patient is actually um, somewhat hypoxic. Um, and if we calculate the alveolar arterial um, oxygen difference, which we can um, easily do using the um, uh, alveolar gas equation, you will see that the alveolar arterial oxygen difference is 24, which is um, relatively high, so we can conclude that there is ventilation perfusion inequality to some extent. And uh, we must not forget that the lung actually does not determine the amount of oxygen that is transferred, but the amount of oxygen that is transferred by the lung is determined by the peripheral tissue, so the, the lung just tries to um, provide to the body what is actually needed. So um, ventilation perfusion inequality must cause um, hypoxemia. Um, on the left panel um, with these little alveolar units, I tried to um, explain this to you because um, it's actually rather easy. Um, in the middle, you see a normal alveolar unit with a um, um, ventilation perfusion index of around one, and the, um, the content of oxygen is roughly um, 19.5 mL per 100 milliliter. And if you have obstructed, um, uh, obstructed ventilation in the alveolar unit, you can go down to, let's say, 15 mL per deciliter. Um, and if the uh, perfusion is obstructed, even if you have very good ventilation, you won't go up to more than 20 mL of oxygen per deciliter. So you can clearly see that uh, you cannot, if, if so to say, if the um, vascular system is obstructed, you cannot um, gain much of uh, uh, oxygen content. But if the alveolar unit is um, in, in trouble, then you will lose a lot of oxygen content. And so uh, ventilation perfusion inequality must cause hypoxemia. And this, as you can see on the left panel, as soon as you, as you have ventilation perfusion inequality, you have a fall in PO2 and a rise in PCO2. And uh, this will lead um, to a reduction, an immediate reduction in um, and the oxygen that is offered um, by the lung and the CO2 consumption. Um, and when this comes back to normal as a new equilibrium, you can only bring, um, bring this to a new steady state, which is uh, toler tolerable for the body if you increase ventilation. So hyperventilation can bring CO2 back to normal, but it n never can resolve hypoxemia even though we are talking not about severe hypoxemia, which obviously can be corrected, but it's, it's not a normal value you can achieve by um, hyperventilation. So having said this, um, I want to look with you at uh, one of our patient, patients that finally went on ECMO. 
And as you can see here, he is uh, ventilated with 100% of oxygen, and this leads to a PO2 of uh, roughly 60 and a PCO2 of uh, 75. And we ventilated this uh, gentleman with a PEEP of 10 and an uh, inspiratory pressure of 26, which led to a tidal volume of 880 mLs. Um, probably uh, too much for a, a proper um, protective ventilation, but we can see that there is severe ventilation perfusion inequality in a preserved compliance. So we may assume that there's also increased dead space because the CO2 is, uh, is uh, elevated. And uh, maybe we observe uh, an impaired hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction that's something we measured with a Swan-Ganz catheter, um, but we can also see that uh, the oxygen um, that is transported is relatively preserved, and the pH um, is uh, 7.299. So this is not this is not a, a big problem um, for for this patient. Um, and we have a mixed venous uh, saturation of 55, so that, that brings up the question, um, should we use an, an inotrope? Um, and we measured the hemodynamics, and as you can see here, um, we don't see any um, pulmonary um, vasoconstriction. The, the resistance uh, has 91 um, dune, which is uh, absolutely normal and the cardiac output is uh, roughly 8 liters. So the hemodynamic is, is not a big problem, which then um, prompts us uh, to another question. This is what should we, what should we do? Um, should we prone this patient and use a higher PEEP? Well, this actually may work or may not work. I'm sorry to, to tell this this way because we we have um, a very preserved uh, tidal volume with not, almost 900 mLs, um, but prone position and also a higher PEEP um, can alter ventilation and perfusion. So it's actually nothing which is very harmful and, and can provide a benefit, um, but you should at least keep your standards. And in this patient, um, we, th we thought that uh, we cannot uh, improve a lot and we are already um, out of uh, protective, um, protective ventilation standards. So we thought uh, this, this man should go on uh, VV ECMO and uh, um, cannulation should, of course, follow the patient uh, needs. So these patients will mainly need Veno venous ECMO. Um, rarely patients might need uh, VA or VVA ECMO, for example, in pulmonary embolism. We just had one patient of that type, and uh, we um, make a standard cannulation um, with a drainage in the um, femoral vein and return the blood to the internal jugular vein. And we had um, at most eight patients with uh, COVID-19 on ECMO. What about proning? Um, of course, you know, and uh, I think this is uh, very robust and very good data. Proning um, can make a difference. Um, also, in uh, patients on ECMO, so you should actually give it give it a try. Um, if there's nothing to recruit, um, in, for example, in the early phase, it might not might not work. Um, however, it's not um, it's not a harmful a harmful thing. And I wanted to also remind you that in veno venous ECMO, um, you will probably need roughly 60% of the cardiac output on ECMO blood flow to achieve a saturation of more than 90%. So probably, as you saw, this one patient had a cardiac output of 8 liters. Um, you will probably need a relatively high ECMO blood flow. 
Um, what is what is different in these patients uh, with COVID-19 and ECMO? Um, we experienced um, that the sedation might be different. So pi patients might need more sedatives than we are accustomed to. Um, so we already early considered volatile anesthetics um, as some of these patients still have um, a relatively good tidal volume. It, it might work, although we saw that you might need a lot of um, volatile anesthetics because of the um, sometimes tremendously increased minute ventilation. Again, uh, fever and also awake states increase CO2 production. So um, in, in this case, consider uh, new, neuromuscular blockers and an aggressive temperature man management. Um, over time, as you saw, we have uh, patients very long on ECMO. Um, you have to question, is it still COVID-19 infection or is it something um, different, for example, bacterial or fungal super infection, or do we see any autoimmune phenomena? So um, we try to do regular microbiological sampling, and uh, we also experienced um, that COVID-19 hygiene measurements not perfectly cover other outbreaks. So we had a, luckily only a minor problem, but uh, we had a problem with uh, Klebsiella. Um, it, everything was uh, um, easily to solve with, with antibiotics because there was no um, multi-resistancy, but it's, it's actually um, annoying. Um, and this, this can obviously happen. And uh, if you face an immune phenomenon, uh, then consider steroids if the infection, sorry, there's an N missing, is uh, controlled and still, for example, ground glass opacities do not resolve. Then, as I pointed out uh, earlier, uh, high ECMO flows might be necessary even if the compliance is preserved and, and relatively good. Um, so in high ECMO flows, you will possibly have a high rate of recirculation, um, which can only be corrected if you um, look at the cannula position. Then you also should monitor the, the oxygen um, that is transported. Um, for example, with uh, physiological parameters like uh, uh, renal function or uh, end organ function, um, warm periphery, um, so to say all that easy, easy stuff, uh, lactate production. Um, if possible, we look also at um, mixed venous saturation, even though this might be um, a bit uh, confounded by, uh, by ECMO and recirculation. But um, if you have some degree of recirculation and uh, mixed venous saturation on the ECMO machine is uh, 60%, then it's probably not, uh, not higher in the patient, of course. And then, as Armin already said, and, and I like this very much, what is acceptable within physiologic boundaries. So if the patient does not have a problem and if, if everything is perfectly um, to survive, uh, then, then don't try to, to push everything to normal because, of course, we're not talking about um, trained mountaineers, but uh, uh, the human um, can tolerate quite a lot and still and still survive. That's why I put um, this famous famous Austrian uh, mountaineer and uh, some some mountains on on this slide. L let me say one word to neuromuscular blockers because it's actually some dirty business. Uh, the Rose study showed that there's no difference between groups um, if you treat uh, patients with uh, cis atracurium early after ARDS onset. Um, but I think in these patients with COVID-19, it might be something different and uh, uh, also in a way to, to reduce the problem of uh, patient-inflicted lung injury 
um, as you heard uh, in the previous talk, it might be necessary to dampen um, all the, the efforts a bit by uh, neuromuscular blockade um, because in the end it doesn't help if you, if you play the game uh, nice, nicely. Um, it, it probably, uh, you should probably play it that you, that you can win and so we decided even if it's not well supported by data, we use neuromuscular blockers if it seems physiologically feasible. Then um, COVID-19 and ECMO, again, what is different, uh, coagulation. Um, COVID-19 is disturbing coagulation in a way we, we cannot, well, at least I cannot explain. Um, we see some uh, phenomena that resemble um, DIC. Um, so we decided rather early that we um, put all patients on anticoagulation basically with heparin and we um, try to achieve a PTT of 45 to 55 seconds, um, be the patient on ECMO or not. Um, in the ECMO patients, we see a high rate of positive hit ELISA, ELISAs, um, but the more specific HEPA test um, is then mainly negative and we don't know what this means, but we change a lot of patients from heparin to agatroban. And then, from my point of view, um, a critical evaluation of concepts is necessary, especially for patients on ECMO, because what we definitely don't want is a bridge to nowhere. Um, there are reports um, from patients uh, from China that have been transplanted with uh, COVID-19 after a while and there are considerations within uh, the Eurotransplant regions if these patients can be transplanted. But from my point of view, this opens, um, this opens a whole new story and uh, it's, it's very difficult to decide whether these patients should be transplanted or not. And this should also be not the the um, part of this talk today, um, but in, in any case, uh, it's very important not to bridge to nowhere. So if, if patients have no chance to recover, um, be, still be patient, um, but then consider palliative care um, and consider uh, also to uh, de-escalate or stop therapies. Um, even if that means that the patient is going to die. Um, so this below is uh, taken from the publication of Luciano Gattinoni in intensive care medicine. Um, all we can do is ventilating or ECMOing these patients to buy time with um, minimal additional damage. Um, so um, try to do everything that does not lead to um, further patient harm. Um, so I want to come back to the uh, case I showed you and I want to highlight um, two parameters, the D-dimers and uh, fibrinogen. It sometimes might be difficult to differentiate between a problem that happens in the patient and a problem that happens in the, in the ECMO circuit. Um, because we experience that all patients have relatively high D-dimers um, that might well be above 10 milligrams per liter, um, which is something we, we don't really observe in, in the normal ARDS patient very frequently. And in the normal ARDS patient on ECMO, high, high or very high D-dimers often point to, um, to a problem within the circuit. Um, from my point of view, but that's just a very early impression, you might differentiate between these two problems um, with fibrinogen because in, in the normal uh, COVID patient, fibrinogen is, is normal or elevated. And uh, as you can see here in this patient, um, the fibrinogen uh, very rapidly dropped 
the D dimers they, they might might have also increased a bit, but as you can see, they were uh, always elevated, but with a normal fibrinogen. And in this in this case, we um, assumed a circuit problem rather than a COVID-19 related coagulation problem, and then we um, decided to to change the circuit. Um, and uh, so you should monitor circuit and uh, changes of the circuit uh, relatively close because it's uh, sometimes difficult to to um, decide. And let me make a few words uh, regarding ventilation and COVID patients on ECMO. Um, of course, we want to protect the lung um, from further uh, lung injury. Um, something that is uh, well achievable on ECMO. Um, but I think we have to, uh, we have to change um, the, the, the means a bit. Um, we did not try to go for the really low titles in these patients because it's sometimes, if, um, especially if they are spontaneously breathing, very difficult to um, to keep them sedated in a way that they have very low titles and on ECMO, they also need a relatively high amount of sweep flow um, to be on a steady CO2 state. Um, we also adopted um, higher tidal volumes and uh, we also accepted higher peak uh, pressure levels, but we still um, aimed at keeping the um, the driving pressure below 15. Um, as Armin pointed out, um, the, the PEEP um, recommendations from the, from the ArtsNet uh, table might not be helpful, so we downgraded the P our in-house PEEP recommendations a bit um, and uh, kept that at least over 8 when we normally would go more to 12 or 14 or even higher. Um, and uh, keep in mind, as Armin said, uh, a higher PEEP in spontaneous breathing patients might also be helpful to reduce uh, self-inflicted lung injury. Um, what about complete lung rest? Um, from my point of view, almost impossible in, in these patients um, with COVID-19 when it might be a good idea in the in the regular um, in the regular patient and then again I want to come back to um, driving pressure in ARDF um, so there is um, sound data and, and to me also convincing data that uh, a decrease in uh, in the driving pressure is uh, bringing a uh, survival benefit to the patient. Uh, so I think we should try to um, adopt this concept also in, uh, in ECMO patients, even if uh, the clinical relevance, uh, according to this analysis of uh, ECMO patients, um, is uh, is, is not really uh, that clear cut, but uh, it's at least the best we we can do from from my point of view. Um, and as you can see um, here, the a difference in driving pressure of 1.2 centimeters of water resulted in a reduction of the hazard ratio, ratio um, of 1.06. Um, which at least um, can contribute to um, improved survival. So I wanted to summarize different uh, recommendations for ventilator settings for mechanical ventilation on ECMO. This is basically taken from the time uh, prior to COVID. And you can see here that this is all based on uh, what we all know. So uh, the, the ELSO suggests a modest PEEP anyway and a low inflation pressure at a very low respiration rate. Um, this might not be, be possible in these very uh, air-hungry 
uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, and uh, we, we try to find a way in between. So we usually go to a peep of 10. We restrict the plateau pressure down to um, 24 normally because no one on our ward likes uh, uneven numbers. Uh, so 24. The respiratory rate would normally be set to 12 and the uh, inspiratory um, O2 would be around 60%. So that's that's basically how we would we would do it, and then reduce the uh, inspiratory uh, oxygen fraction um, further down, um, or reduce uh, or reduce the blood flow. So um, my recommendations, but they don't necessarily need to be uh, correct for these patients. That's just uh, our observation. Um, we would reduce the respiratory rate on ECMO down to 12 and try to reduce the um, breathing efforts of the patients, uh, maybe also with uh, neuromuscular blockade. Um, we would um, increase the, the time, um, the, the inspiratory time to increase the mean airway pressure, um, and we would probably just um, aim for a uh, oxygen saturation of above 88 because I think that's that's fair enough if uh, DO2 is preserved and uh, hemoglobin is, is not um, very low. Um, saying, saying that we don't uh, have, an, have a special hemoglobin target so we would also um, transfuse patients according to physiological um, transfusion triggers. So we also would accept, let's say, a hemoglobin of 7.5 grams per deciliter uh, if, if everything else is, is fine. And then we would reduce the plateau pressures, or we would, we, we would somehow play with the PEEP and also closely monitor for right heart failure because in the very high um, PEEP uh, levels, we, we also treated patients initially with uh, rather high PEEPs. Um, if these patients have uh, high tidal volumes, the obviously intrathoracic pressure um, can be relatively high, which leads to um, a relatively high um, right ventricular afterload. And uh, you should just have a, have a look on, on that um, to prevent right heart failure. Then, of course, um, we would consider prone positioning also on ECMO, and uh, especially if you have uh, something like like that in the in the panel below. And as always, uh, we would try to wean the patient off ECMO as fast as possible because it's uh, still um, better to have uh, the, the patient safe off ECMO than on ECMO. Um, so in conclusion, I would say ECMO can be a very good idea in COVID-19 patients. Um, I would say this also against um, the published data um, that showed a poor outcome uh, for ECMO. Um, ECMO, as always, can facilitate an ultra-protective ventilation in patients with uh, severe ARDS or in patients with uh, severe hypoxemia especially um, by reducing the need for ventilation because also the EOLIA trial um, nicely showed that uh, the, the technical part of the ECMO um, works, um, but uh, the technical part is, is one side. Uh, the advantage of this facilitated ventilation must always be protected against adverse ev effects uh, the ECMO might have. Um, mainly thrombosis and bleeding, and this is uh, a problem in, in COVID-19 patients uh, anyway, especially the, the thrombosis side. And uh, please keep in mind that COVID-19 uh, seems to be a very slowly resolving problem, so we have uh, patients very long uh, on the ICU and very long on ECMO, and my personal recommendation would be don't start an ECMO program 
um, just with these uh, COVID-19 patients. Um, I think started uh, afterwards and uh, tried to transfer these patients um, to um, centers with a long-standing experience uh, with uh, ECMO and ARDS patients. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I would uh, be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Kalenka and Dr. Lepper for sharing your expertise and insights. For the time we have remaining, we will now address as many submitted questions as possible. While we want to thank everyone for your engagement, unfortunately, we will not have enough time to respond to all submissions. Additionally, please note that questions and responses may not be relevant in all countries. With that, I'll move to our first question. Our first question goes to Dr. Kalenka. Which phenotype, H or L, is more likely to suffer from a self-inflicted lung injury? Yeah, thanks for that uh, excellent question. Obviously, the type H is the end of the final road of the patient. So that means, in this perspective, it's more the type L which is getting harmed by self-inflicted lung injury. On the other side, as I told you before, you have to be very cautious and careful with the patient going into the weaning process because the patient at any time can deteriorate by his self-inflicted lung injury. So that means our strategy is to get the patient where it is and do nothing, anything harmful anymore for the patient. So we try to reduce these so-called self-inflicted lung injury. Great, thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Lepper. Dr. Lepper, did you use ECMO and prone position simultaneously? If yes, did you experience any particular issue or challenge? Uh, we actually used um, prone position and ECMO simultaneously in, in COVID-19 patients. Um, we, we did not observe any particular differences between um, normal ARDS patients um, that get prone positioning and uh, uh, ECMO simultaneously or patients that are prone without ECMO. I think in, in that respect, it's all sort of standard. Thank you. Dr. Kalenka, it's interesting to see the FRC usage in determining type H and type L patients. Do you use this with every patient? If so, how often do you calculate the patient's FRC? Is it daily, multiple times per day? Yeah, what I showed you is the, the so-called decremental PEEP trial, where we try to find the optimal PEEP for uh, the individual patient. And yes, of course, we have the opportunity to doing this FRC or better end exploratory lung volume measurement. And we are doing it in routine in every critical uh, patient with hypoxia. And we're doing it normally once for titrating the PEEP. And then every day to see if our PEEP is still on that level where we want to have it. And as I showed you, it's uh, the non-invasive uh, situation. You don't have to put the patient to CT scan to see in which, which condition is the patient. So you can measure bedside daily as often as you want uh, the baby lung size, which is uh, implemented many years ago by Gattino. Yes, we're doing that originally. Thank you. Dr. Lepper. Do you find that the ECMO patient requires additional support, alternative configurations, excessive sedation? Uh, we actually experienced that the um, COVID-19 patients um, need more uh, sedation, at least in the initial phase, than um, regular ARDS patients. I cannot explain 
why this is the case. I assume it is um, because there is, from a certain um, point in the development, uh, such a ventilation perfusion uh, mismatch that it causes extreme um, distress for the patient. And this distress causes then agitation and in turn it needs um, a lot of sedation to keep the patients within the the ideas of protective ventilation. Thank no, you. No, Dr. Kalenka. No. Sorry, sorry. Sorry, Dr. Leppard. Um, they, they didn't need um, uh, sort of additional support. I mean, all the additional supportive measures that are made, for example, treat um, elevated pulmonary pressures or, um, or proning or um, circulatory support, um, of course, need to be done. Um, we just had one patient with an s sort of alternative configuration that was um, VVA ECMO because the patient experienced a severe pulmonary embolism um, that prompted us to put him on uh, VA and then uh, add later on uh, um, a venous return. Dr. Kalenka, any difference in treatment strategy based on age of the COVID-19 patient, elderly versus pediatric? Uh, honestly, in pediatric uh, patients, I don't have personal uh, experience. But as you see, most of the scientific literature is based on acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if you go into the guidelines for pediatric ARDS patients, it's more or less the same like in adults. So that means low tidal volume ventilation, driving pressure orientated management, and so on and so on. So I'm not an expert in that field, so I would not give a clear answer, unfortunately. Thank you. Dr. Lepper, do you think some drugs in your critical care management make a difference in the treatment in these COVID-19 cases? Unfortunately, not. Um, from my point of view, there is up to now no convincing specific treatment of coronavirus or SARS coronavirus type 2. Um, so there was not a single substance that we used that from our point of view made a difference in these patients. So we, we relatively soon um, did not treat patients with uh, hydroxychloroquine because we had the impression that it absolutely does not make any difference. Um, we did not yet use remdesivir because we simply did not have a um, patient that was uh, fulfilling the inclusion criteria for the Gilead uh, study, um, unfortunately, or luckily, <laughs> depends on how you see it. Uh, I think we need to wait till there is a specific treatment that will make a difference. Thank you. Dr. Kalenka, do you see a role for esophageal pressure monitoring in COVID-19, considering the specific characteristics of the disease? Yeah, the, 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 the new uh, hypoxic uh, lung injury by COVID-19 is an excellent field for uh, scientific studies in the role of esophageal measurement, because by this tool, you will be able to measure and calculate the respiratory drive of the patient. Unfortunately, uh, COVID-19 is suffering the whole world, and most of our colleagues are not able to measure esophageal pressure. I would say it's around up to 5% in the world. So we are using the tool, we are measurement, and we can see exactly that what is described by other colleagues in the literature. These patients have enormous respiratory drive, especially if they are still spontaneous breathing. 
Uh, unfortunately, there is no single study where you have a clear signal what you have to do after that with this extreme respiratory drive. We learned that it's not good for the patient, it's a so-called self-inflicted lung injury, but we not have enough uh, esophageal pressure measurements and especially trials where we can clearly show how to handle these patients, unfortunately. Yes. Great. So it looks like we'll have time for one more question, and this question goes to Dr. Lepper. Overall, in your experience, what is the success rate of ECMO in COVID-19 patients? That is a, a difficult to answer question, surprisingly difficult uh, to answer question, because we had... Um, it, it depends on how success rate is defined. Is success rate overall survival, then um, the success rate of ECMO is roughly uh, 50%, but we still have patients on ECMO. Um, I would prefer to define success rate of ECMO in, in a different way because um, patients we lost um, on ECMO were, for example, um, turned to palliative care and the, the aim of the therapy was, was changed because of the overall comorbidities and the, uh, the, the probable will of the patient. So it was assumed that the patient does not want to um, go through the whole thing with a a uh, huge impairment of quality in life. So the patient was roughly 16 days on ECMO, and then we changed the aim of our therapy to a, to palliative care. Um, then there was a patient who had severe um, uh, gut ischemia. So he the um, the large intestine was um, was uh, Hyperperfused, and he received surgery, and it was not it was not correctable, and this patient died from uh, septic shock and uh, disseminated intravasal coagulation and bleeding. Still on ECMO, but not necessarily a failure of ECMO, but uh, a failure of uh, let's say of of the body in in a sense. So it's, it's really difficult. Obviously, ECMO can buy time and can buy a lot of time for the patient to heal. But if the patient does not heal after, let's say, three or four weeks, it might be very, very difficult. But from, from my point of view, the success rate of ECMO is very high in a sense that it, it just buys you time to, um, to give the, the body a chance to overcome the viral infection and then to to come out of the the whole thing. Thank you. Our time together is coming to a close. Thank you for your time and attention during this webcast. And even more importantly, thank you for all you are doing to care for COVID-19 patients. We'd like to take this time to inform you of our next webinar entitled Practical Application of nutrition therapy in COVID-19 ICU patients. The presentation will be delivered by Dr. Arthur Van Benton and Jennifer Woolley on Thursday, May 21st. You can register today using the link provided in the resources list on your webinar console. Otherwise, please keep an eye out for an email invitation. Also, in the resources widget on your desktop, you can find a link to GE Healthcare's ICU Ventilation User Resources webpage, which provides details on how to operate the CareScape R860 ventilator, along with weaning and infection control resources. Thank you again, and stay well.